Sure, the, the, the report is very comprehensive. It, it uh, touches upon many, many dimensions uh, with very updated figures and uh, very nice graphs. Um, so I learned a lot. Uh, there's uh, a few things, though, that um, um, puzzled me in a way. So I think the first thing I, I would like to, to say, I think it relates to what uh, Albert was saying about the growth forecast and the growth um, uh, objectives. There's a sense of a little bit of mismatch that you present the official somehow growth targets. After that, you indicate that there are some warning signs that are turning red in terms of uh, declining returns to investment, death, depth risks, and, you, and, and then this, this somehow a missing um, look ba uh, loop back. Uh, so what I'm thinking is that what you have in your head is that something, some new engine will start. Okay, so uh, investment uh, is not going to be the main engine. So I guess you think of uh, productivity and you think of services. But then when I think of those two things, it, to me there's a little bit of a tension between the feeling that rebalancing will uh, occur with uh, development of services and the need for greater uh, growth in, in productivity. Because when you think about it, the last decades were about very fast productivity due to the switch of people away from agriculture manufacturing because mechanically manufacturing jobs are more productive and then if you think about it so just very caricatural thing you just keep the labor force constant and you switch people from manufacturing to services now labor I mean productivity labor productivity will go down so I understand that it's a caricature because at the same time the labor force could expand but in the case of China, this is not so sure because we are uh, it's the, the end of the um, demographic dividend. So it could be, in fact, you know, given mass of people and uh, people switching from manufacturing to services. And as Albert was saying, eventually what we see happening is that those services are not even the higher tier in terms of productivity and uh, performance and, and wage in terms of services. So I guess what you have in mind is that there's, and I think it's described in the, in the report, is that there's some uh, inefficiency gap. Uh, and you report that very well. Actually, services are very, very backward. I mean, the productivity is, is uh, uh, much uh, uh, later uh, compared to the US standard that what, uh, we have for manufacturing. So you expect that um, there will be some room for progress. But there are some um, challenges, as you said, because those are precisely the services that have some uh, entry barriers. My feeling is that if you add everything up, there should be some kind of a, 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 some kind of decline and eventually later a catch up. Okay? So to me, it doesn't add up to this prospect of keeping up 6.5% for an additional four years. That's uh, my guess. And related to the last thing uh, that uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, which is retirement age. So there, I'm a little bit puzzled because I see where you go. You, it's the end of the demographic dividend, so the fact that you don't have as many youngsters coming into the labor force. Um, and there's the hope of what we call the second demographic dividend, which is that as people um, uh, stay alive longer, you can have them work longer hours, uh, longer ages. But the problem in, in China, I think that the situation is not so um, giving you a lot of hope because the, the specificity of the, this cohort, which is reaching now 55 for women, and that you would like to keep on the job for an additional 10 years, those people are really low skilled, low educated, and in a way, it's, I'm not so sure that it's going to give you this um, second demographic dividend uh, strength that you can hope. Okay, so. Um, uh, I, I mean, I'm not so sure I would recommend that. And I, I remember I, I read a, uh, the, the book by uh, Tsai Feng, Feng Tsai, or the other way around. Tsai is his uh, family name, and he's very, very uh, skeptical about this proposition that extending um, the, the retirement age would be uh, giving you some bonus. Now, uh, I, I had a little hiccup also, as uh, Albert, on this uh, proposition that you should broaden the number of sectors benefiting from government support for innovation. First, I was very surprised because I didn't know that figure that everything was uh, focused on infrastructure. So I guess uh, it is related to the ownership of the firms. So I, I didn't really know exactly what, what kind of support we were looking at, whether it was loans or direct subsidies. Because my, 
my reading of all those uh, very ambitious plans, repeated uh, calls for turning China into a manufacturing superpower, smart manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. blah, blah, blah I should not say that. Um, uh, in fact, was, you know, just, um, just open up uh, the, the lawns and that it flushes uh, everywhere. So, I mean, I, I, I'd like to have more grounds on this part. And then if I think about it, I'm not so sure that we should recommend that, um, you know, um, this policy of trying to robotize, upgrade, encourage everyone to equip and use uh, digital uh, software is really the way to go. I mean, my understanding of um, criticism that I've been uh, voiced uh, recently is that it's a really top-down approach. And in fact, it is creating incentives that are, no, I mean, that could be backfiring because it's, it doesn't re respond to, um, um, I mean, specific needs from the bottom. And what it is doing is, is creating a craze where we see uh, firms that are robotized themselves even though they, they don't maybe need it. Uh, I see that uh, there's uh, the development of robotic industries. Like you, you have so many plans that um, if you add up their objectives of production, it's like 10 times what China would need. So it would just create an additional overcapacity bubble. And, so, I mean, I'm not sure that pushing China into extending further this top bottom um, call for even more subsidies is really the way to go. Um, okay. Uh, the last point, the last, last point I would like to make is a way, uh, again, a kind of tension between this uh, official um, objective of upgrading and the attention that the OECD spends a lot of time looking at on the um, even level playing field. Okay, so my impression is that if you look at the documents, when China says, I'd like to um, climb up the, the ladder, be able to master the inputs that previously we were importing, there's a feeling that they also, of course they will extend loans, but they also will put in place some local content targets. And to me, this somehow uh, clashes against the willingness to provide to domestic firms and foreign firms the same kind of conditions. And in a way, my, my, my belief is that um, there should be more, uh, let's say, inquiry or attention paid to how exactly it's gonna be put in place. Because to, to me, it could definitely overturn the progresses that you praise in the report, possibly they are there, in terms of easing of administrative burdens, of streamlining of procedure, but it, everything could be undone just because they are just so um, into establishing 40% uh, of mobile phones should be made, uh, cells, uh, chips should be made in China, and they have so many targets that are just very specific. Uh, and in order to implement that, um, I guess they will have to resort to anti-market uh, friendly uh, measures. So. Uh, I thought that there was uh, little attention to, to that in the report and to um, buckle the loop or to, to loop the loop, I don't know how you say that. Um, if you think of upgrading again, um, I think very little attention is paid to the fact that um, a lot of, of jobs are gonna be lost. Uh, and uh, here again, um, so there are two things. I'm not so sure that uh, social healthcare is there, I mean social um, safety nets are there to uh, absorb or to, to help those people that are going to lose their job. And uh, related to training, I'm not so sure that, um, I mean, I know that uh, two years ago you spent a lot of time looking at the education system, but uh, is there a specific interest in making sure that the Chinese education system is preparing uh, the future cohort of skilled personnel um, to operate those sophisticated and smart uh, uh, machines? Yeah, that's uh, my, my question. Thank you. So I fully agree that uh, the religion of uh, targets is a bit uh, outdated and may have served as a coordination device in earlier phases of development, but uh, has a lot of uh, unwelcome side effects. Uh, 
<laughs> the, trying at all costs uh, to meet an, uh, uh, a target, top-down target, uh, leads to what we've seen in Lioning, which I was referring to, which is basically cheating with the numbers, uh, undermines the credibility of uh, the, the official data. So um, there are perverse effects, and, and uh, more than just the data, uh, it encourages uh, forms of growth that are not sustainable or, or desirable, uh, because uh, as you said, they, they know how to do it, and uh, in fact, um, one way in which uh, six or uh, percent plus growth will be maintained in the short run may be through projects that are not necessarily uh, of high social value uh, over the longer run. Uh, so we may see further white elephants or uh, further uh, ghost towns or, or things that are not really warranted from a, a social point of view happening uh, just to, to keep up growth in some provinces uh, in line with uh, national targets. Uh, the IMF has been more outspoken perhaps uh, at times than, than we have been in their reports to uh, encourage the government to drop uh, uh, or soften uh, the growth targets. For example, the IMF has been arguing for a range rather than a point target, which is a soft way to express this criticism, but what we really feel like you is that uh, these targets should be no more. Um, uh, and the IMF, uh, like we do here also, uh, has underlined the trade-off between achieving these targets in the short run and, and the longer run, uh, sustainability of growth. Um, on on um, Sandra's point about uh, manufacturing uh, and services and, and what this means for productivity, uh, I agree that indeed uh, service sector productivity on average is, is low compared to OECD countries, but there is also a shift uh, from rural areas into services. If I think about uh, all these delivery sector jobs that the, the digital economy has uh, uh, brought about, the, the State Information Center has actually published a report earlier this week on the digital economy and on the line that something like six million jobs had been created. Uh, these are not very high skilled jobs, but there are uh, new urban jobs with higher productivity than uh, uh, can be achieved in rural areas by people who are underemployed uh, back in the villages. So if you think of it, a shift from agriculture to the, the, the service sectors, then uh, maybe there's still productivity gains to, to be had uh, in terms of uh, rebalancing away from the traditional sectors. Um, maybe, Margaret, you can take the, other, the harder questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, let me start with the question that was raised by both discussants, uh, which is um, uh, probably uh, we didn't put it clear enough. That's why uh, it might have been uh, misinterpreted. We are not asking for more subsidies. Um, <laughs> we are actually saying not to exclude certain uh, industries from government uh, innovation support. So basically not to limit government investment uh, uh, I'm sorry, government innovation support to uh, those uh, sectors that are defined by industrial policies. So in, in that fact, we are actually uh, saying what you are saying, uh, which is not in favor of uh, industrial policy, but to uh, give the possibility of getting government support to more industries, not just, uh, not just a few. Um, on the state-owned enterprise uh, reform, um, our core recommendation on state-owned enterprise reform is to gradually remove the implicit guarantees to state-owned enterprises and also other public entities that uh, mentioned, uh, like uh, local government investment vehicles. So, Because we think that by removing these implicit guarantees that now make possible state-owned enterprises to roll over their loans or, or to borrow even though they would not be able to repay their loans. I mean, that's our, that is behind uh, a lot of issues uh, that we can see in the economy. That is behind the high corporate debt, and that is behind the low efficiency, because the state-owned sector is still relatively large. Um, I don't remember the numbers, but in the previous survey in 2015, uh, we looked at the share of the state-owned sector, both um, in terms of employment and in terms of uh, output in all the services sectors. And in some services, it's still very high. And even in some commercial services, such as, for instance, uh, uh, construction or professional services, uh, or for instance, let's say, uh, computer services. Uh, so we used the 2008 uh, 
economic census to uh, to do this analysis. So it's it's fully uh, comprehensive. So what we recommended at that time, and to some uh, to certain extent, we also include in this report, is that the the state should get out of uh, those industries that uh, are inherently um, commercial, so including like uh, hotels, restaurants, uh, including. Uh, like professional services or computer services. So, so we do recommend that. What we don't recommend is, uh, is the privatization of all state-owned enterprises. And that is mainly because there are many OECD countries where the state-owned sector is relatively large, including France or, uh, for instance, Norway as well. So we don't think that the only way to make uh, state-owned enterprises productive or efficient is by privatizing them. So uh, we, we divide the ownership uh, issue from uh, efficiency or productivity issues. So, so the main recommendation is to remove implicit guarantees so the exposed state-owned enterprises to the same uh, conditions as the private enterprises are exposed. And of course, that includes, which recommended in both surveys in, in the past two years, is uh, to uh, open up more sectors to private entry, in, uh, in particular in the services industries. So we, we do recommend that. And uh, for private industries and also for foreign uh, enterprises. At the OECD, we have another uh, indicator which shows uh, foreign direct investment. It's an FDI restrictiveness indicator, which uh, is relatively high in China. We have it by industrial decomposition. Um, where is the reason? On, the, on the retirement age, I mean, we mainly um, look at uh, from the point of view of uh, sustainability of the pension system. So uh, at, at such a low retirement age, given that uh, the expected um, lifetime of uh, Chinese people is increasing, and it's already very high. It's already much above the OECD average, while the retirement age is much below the OECD average. So with, with such, and not, not to mention the demographics, where China is aging faster than, for instance, Japan, and, and fa definitely faster than all OECD countries. So, so looking at these trends, I mean, there's no other way to make it sustainable than by change in the parameters. I think that's, and all skills, um, um, yeah, that also was also covered in the previous survey. Um, we found using uh, micro data that the most lagging skills in the economy are computer programming and soft skills such as sales and marketing skills. So we use like 800,000 uh, uh, graduates. So we only looked at college graduates, uh, 800,000 college graduates, and I looked at what are the, the skills. So after uh, half a year after they're employed, they had to judge um, how their skills uh, match the requirements of the job. Of course, uh, only those cases were considered where they um, um, got the jobs in their own profession. I just want to ask something very simple, and uh, I understand a lot of issues that you discussed, but why do they need to grow so fast? And they're aware of the debt growth. At the current pace, I'm pretty sure it would be over 300% debt to GDP by 2020, could it meet the target? I'm pretty sure they do, can meet the target, but what are they thinking? Why is it worth it to generate this much debt? Uh, yes, this is a question for Dr. Molnar. You mentioned that um, uh, in, in China, social and econ socio and economic factors are a much greater obstacle to uh, performance. You mentioned the the um, various statistics. What's the reason for the difference from other o from from the OECD countries? Um, yeah, when uh, I look at the graph, uh, actually one uh, is very impressive to me is about this uh, PPI. Actually, in 2016, right, actually it's a miracle. You know, it's been uh, actually negative, you know, uh, growth, and suddenly from 2016 become a positive growth, right? To actually, is it actually a, a proof that what we call the supply chain reform in China is actually successful, right? Uh, here, actually, we, we understand the Chinese government actually advocate a policy, right? It's a free reduction 
I talk about you know uh, reduce uh, excess capacity, reduce storage, and also reduce the leverage, and also it talk about you know lower you know all these uh, transaction costs right and uh, also plus one subsidy. I mean that they will actually target you know certain industry and provide government subsidy you know actually to encourage both. Do you think this actually will um, turn China uh, you know going to another stage just like the other OECD countries here? Yeah. My question is for the OECD uh, research. Uh, have you also touched on the, the pro progression of PPP and what contribution it will make in the next uh, five years to the China economy, particularly the structural part in terms of uh, state ownership and private ownership? I think the progress is very fast and we see a big change in that area, but it is not covered in this survey. Um, I would like to comment on um, what Albert said about the uh, contribution to pension. Um, if I if I hear it correctly, you're saying that it's not enough, right? There should be more in terms of contribution. No, I don't think so. No. I don't think it should be more. Oh, okay. Right. The, the the point I want to make is, you know, it, it's not um, the how much you actually put in, is how much you're able to collect at retirement. It's a payout stage, which at the moment, uh, from experience, is, is poultry. And uh, experience with the employee is that, you know, um, we prefer that, you know, you, you comply with the law, but anything in excess, can you pay it to us in the form of bonus or, or whatever, and an allowance, rather than paying to the, uh, the contribution. I think uh, uh, the government must look into it and see the fairness in terms of, you know, the payout, you know. I know that, you know, there is a cap, you know, uh, the, the contribution, uh, there is a city average uh, uh, salary, uh, which is based on the, the contribution rate. And if you earn a lot more, you know, there, there's a cap. Um, uh, nonetheless, you know, there are people who earn far less and um, they're putting in less, but at the payout uh, stage, everyone will get the same. You know, which is which is unfair, and that is a deterrent. Okay, so so I'll I'll start uh, um, on the question of uh, why do they want such continued fast growth? Um, from their point of view, uh, growth is no longer that fast. I mean, they have been used for three decades to grow at double-digit rates on average. Uh, now six, six and a half for them is a modest growth. Uh, they see India growing faster than China, of course, from a much lower base. And there are also questions about the, China, the Indian numbers, which are, are not uh, fully credible. But uh, still, there is a sense among the leadership that uh, six, six and a half is not that fast. And more importantly, there is the sacred goal of doubling GDP per capita by 2020 that was set back in 2010. And this being a target, they will meet it, uh, or they will even exceed it. At least they, they will uh, achieve it, or make sure to, to achieve it for better or for worse. And indeed, at the price of further debt accumulation uh, in a number of, of areas, uh, likely. Um, on the change, of course, of the PPI, uh, I think this does indeed reflect uh, several factors. One is the commodity price cycle. Uh, you may recall that a year and a half ago or so, oil prices were really very low, and then they started to rebound from the 20s to uh, nowadays around uh, the low 50s for Brent oil per barrel. So that is a big change in, in the landscape for producer prices. And then, indeed, overcapacity has been reduced in a number of sectors. We can quarrel about how much has actually been achieved. We've seen the official numbers uh, for coal and steel in particular, uh, uh, significant reductions on the surface of overcapacity. Although, in practice, what are the facilities that have been closed? And are these closures or just uh, temporary closures? Or what is it that we are looking at is not clear. But uh, Yes, there has been uh, less overcapacity at the end of the year, and so that should help uh, push back up uh, producer prices. It was abnormal to see producer prices decline by 4% per year per annum for, for five years in a row. Um, so on, on PPPs and, and uh, pension. First of all, on, on, the, on the social factors um, influencing a student um, uh, test or test outcomes, 
Um, there have been a lot of discussions about uh, social mobility. And uh, in the last survey in 2015, uh, we did empirical analysis on uh, looking at the family background impact on uh, young college graduates' uh, wages. And we found that the family back background is very important. So th this uh, basically controlling, of course, for many other factors, um, it, it shows that uh, social mobility is very limited in China. And that is, um, can be traced back to the very large urban-rural gap. So basically, whether you were born in, if you were born in a rural area, uh, then I mean, you have very little chances to, to move up. That's because of the social connections, because of the, the schools that uh, you can attend. So, so that's uh, because of this uh, huge divide. On the, on the PPPs, um, yes, PPPs have been increasing very fast, but there have been also some, uh, there has been some criticism uh, saying that um, PPPs are not public-private uh, any longer, but they are more like public-public uh, partnerships. So uh, that is more and more uh, public funds are channeled into PPPs. And I mean, uh, judging just from the input side, from the number of the increase in, the, in, 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 in PPP projects, I mean, it's very hard to judge. But I mean, in general, uh, PPPs uh, should be only implemented where there's a, a proper um, a fiscal uh, control because they can lead to um, contingent liabilities as has been the case in many OECD countries. So we don't in general recommend uh, the use of PPPs unless there is a proper uh, control system put in place. Um, on, the, on the pension system, I mean, if uh, people uh, contribute more in a sense by increasing the retirement age, that would be contribu uh, contributing for longer years. It has to be made clear that um, uh, by contributing more, so more years, they would also uh, get more when they retire. So, so that's uh, the, the, the two should come hand in hand. And this time we didn't go into the details, but yes, you are right. I mean, there should not be a, a cap on pension um, payments because that can also be a a way of redistribution, but we only dealt with it some previous economic surveys, not with this in detail. Well, I, just on the retirement age, I have I strongly endorse the recommendation that they should increase the retirement ages uh, in China, and uh, part of it is I think it's, it'll, it'll help the sustainability of the pension program because they, you know, th if they're paying out at such a young age and life expectancy increasing, that's very difficult, but. Uh, I think even though the current, I think you're right, the current old workers are not skilled and nobody wants to keep them around. But raising retirement age is just saying that uh, you can still build in flexibility. So at least people don't have to retire if they're productive, right? I mean, maybe it's, it, they can still retire, but to force productive people to retire is not good. And you, of course, need to also pair it with more flexible wage payments at retirement age so that you can shift to a different kind of a contract like they do in places like Japan, right? So that co companies are willing to keep you on, but at a lower wage, and some people are happy with that, and then you can get more uh, work out of that. But moreover, uh, the coming cohorts will be more and more educated. So you just need to put the framework in place. So eventually, you certainly are going to want these more skilled, uh, older people to be have the option uh, to work longer. And the last thing I think, the work on the aging stuff, which I, another issue with retirement which isn't emphasized enough, is that when you lengthen the retirement age, it also, be, because people see that's in their future, they're going to have to work for longer, it actually encourages more human capital investment. They invest more in their careers. They invest more in reskilling, knowing that they're going to have to work longer. So I actually think having a lower retirement age for women has really made it harder for women in the labor force to get promoted to the higher levels, because both they and their employers don't feel they should invest as much in them because they're going to get less productivity out of them. So there's that whole um, angle as well. I want to follow up on the debt and growth question. That's all I understand where you're coming from. But you take it one step further. Is it more human nature that, or part of political system because investment driven growth has worked with them so well? And uh, it's being so command-driven economy, you're too hard for them to change or something? 
I think they understand the risk. There's still debt capacity. Why not keep growing at the same rate? And they perhaps may break out a middle income trap and then deal with the problem later. This is more it's very similar to politicians around the world and the super, so-called super debt cycle we see around the world. It's just the nature of the system. Who wants to deleverage when you can grow? Would you agree with that? Uh, I think you have a good point. Uh, on, on PPPs, if I may add, I, I worked on the United Kingdom uh, two decades ago, and there was a lively debate on the merits of uh, such uh, public-private partnerships, and uh, a lot of skepticism on the part of some specialists uh, that uh, this kind of uh, uh, contracting was, first of all, a way to put uh, uh, public liabilities off balance sheet and to hide what are, in effect, uh, fiscal uh, 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 burdens down the road. And on the other hand, it increases contracting costs because it's complicated to design contracts where uh, the public sector can ensure that the private sector will not profiteer from the public sector and, and use the opportunity to uh, uh, build uh, things that don't need to be built or, or uh, uh, other forms of abuse. There, there have been uh, audits back in the 1990s already of the Sky Bridge in Scotland is one example where uh, the private sector really used the opportunity of a PPP to, to make money on, on, on the back of taxpayers. Um, so uh, uh, we, we are cautious, as, as market under, uh, underlined, uh, that framework conditions need to be right and monitoring needs to be right. Uh, uh, the, the case of the uh, special financing platforms, 17,000 of which exist on some estimates around the, uh, China, is, is a case in point some of these are to some extent, a form of PPP, which is very badly monitored and controlled, and gives rise to many uh, types of abusive behavior. So there are good PPPs, but there are also many forms of uh, uh, problematic PPPs. I don't know if you we're good. Or no more questions? Uh, yeah. uh, on the subject that presented by Professor Park on the um, employment of college graduates into the higher pay service industry, I, I need to know a lot into the details about, about the construction of a survey, but it seems to contradict what, what I have encountered and observed and seen in the last 10 years in working with college graduates in the employment market. When I compare the big scale job fair, in Shanghai, in the big cities, in the last 10 years, the changes from Shanghai to Shenzhen. Uh, I know a lot about Hong Kong market, but always go to the big graduate job fairs in, in China. I noticed that the higher paying service jobs are coming up pretty fast in the last three to five years. That uh, ultimately it will contribute to higher paying service jobs among the college graduates, particularly in the IT industry. But your survey did not say that that is the story. The next is about the definition of college graduates, because we need to compare across countries, because China has a very high admission rate of uh, college graduates. And uh, international employers always comment that only 20% of China graduates are employable. So if you, if you take the total population and college graduates, you may get a dilution effect. So I, I really wish to know the, the way that you get your data and compare with my knowledge on college graduates. Uh, so I, I agree with these comments. I, I think I was just looking at the census data. So it's everybody. And uh, I think one thing is in the most recent five-year period, actually, you do see the high-skilled services growing faster than the low-skilled services. So that's consistent with what you are saying in the last three to five years, there's been some action in the improved employment quantity of these types of graduates. The other thing is, I think I want to just emphasize what you just said, is that there are a lot of really low quality colleges in China, especially if you include the Dajuan, you know, the vocational colleges. Some of them used to be, you know, high school technical training schools that just got, you know, because there was a desire to expand higher education in China, they just got relabeled without really upgrading their faculty or anything, right? And so. Uh, and across the whole country, there are a lot of these kind of low quality. So for those college graduates, they're not going to the Shanghai job fair, right? And they're getting jobs which are not in 
IT and they're getting a lot of office type jobs or things where they're not um, they're not so productive I think and so that may be uh, coloring I think it'd be better to be to distinguish college graduates by you know the elite colleges and different and even by degrees I think you would see quite uh, different results. In your results. study, narrow the, the range of these producers differently. I would say the top, top 30, 40 percent. I would imagine, yeah. but um, I haven't done that analysis. So I'm, I'm not sure uh, see, about you, what the big you, numbers you are. The same yeah. benchmark like the Hong Kong market. The, the 30 percent of the graduates. But I'm, I mean, and even in Hong Kong, yeah. we're talking about how this has changed over time, right? I mean, wages for college graduates is not, are not so high now, right? right? That is a very, very exactly. interesting story. So, so I'm not sure yeah, even about the trends in Hong Kong, what they are. But that's a completely <laughs> separate set of issues. So maybe we shouldn't go down there. Actually, we did this analysis. When we uh, did the skill gap estimation for the previous survey in 2015, uh, we looked at data of uh, 800,000 college graduates, and that includes this area, the, the top university graduates, then also it includes the other university graduates, and it includes this, the technical vocational um, college, the, the Tajwa. <clears throat> so uh, we, we differentiated it, and we, we estimated this gap by type. And actually, although the size of the gap was uh, different, I mean, obviously, uh, the uh, better universities, they had a smaller size of the gap. But in terms of uh, the areas, the skill areas where uh, the gap was the biggest, there was no difference. So whether it was uh, this um, 211, uh, the top universities, or other universities, or the vocational colleges, it was always computer programming where deficiencies were the highest, the skill gap was the highest and also soft, soft skills, no matter which type. So although the, the size of the, the gap was uh, different. Last minute question, yes. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Monat. Uh, a very technical question to the chart. Uh, you are showing the leverage of different types of firms, and you are grouping the SOEs into central, local, and agency type. And uh, my question is, are uh, local government financing vehicles belong to one of the grouping, or they are not included at all? Technically, the local government financing vehicles are not SOEs, so they are not included. Uh, what we included here is um, uh, those 150, whatever thousand, between 150, 160,000 um, SOEs. So it's only the ones that are called state-owned enterprises. So the local government financing vehicles are not technically SOEs, so they are not included. That uh, technical note, I think we can close uh, the session. Thank you very much, uh, you all, for coming here and spending uh, two, year, two years, two hours. And uh, there's a small buffet waiting for you. There's one bottle of French wine, I guess, so we have to rush on it. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.